Throughout all of the Persona games, aspects of its shared universe have shifted around in just about every numbered release, be it the existence of demons in the everyday world, or how our leads summon their Personas, or even just the protagonist's Arcana as well. I mean, right up till Persona 3 and 5, that is. Though even after years of universe modification and resets, there exists one constant throughout all of the universes. And this place has always remained the same throughout all of Persona, albeit under many different designs and with changing gameplay effects, but it's always been a safe haven for Persona users, and a place where growth and evolution are made physical. And of course, it's always been headed by its never-changing host and his assortment of entertainers. That place is the Velvet Room. to the Velvet Room, my dear young man. So before we can get started, there's one thing that you should know that's very major. It is the Velvet Room. A singular room. There aren't multiple Velvet Rooms, even though there are many designs of it. That is because the room itself changes to match the guest who enters it. In fact, the same could be said about the attendants inside the Velvet Room, to a certain degree. Though before we can get into that, we should actually discuss the origin of the room itself, both creatively and in-universe. So first off, the question to ask is, where does the name Velvet Room come from? Well, the velvet part of it comes from the material and the color. You see, the material velvet actually had an unusually pleasant softness to it, especially when compared to other fabrics at the time of its creation. And due to this, and its high production requirements, it was usually only worn by kings and rulers. So the idea of a room itself being made of this material implies that it's a rather important room, or in some way, otherworldly, while also assuring the player that they will always be safe while inside the boundaries of this room. Y usually. Now the color choice for the Velvet Room is actually a very interesting decision on the part of the creators. This is because the Velvet Blue of the Velvet Room is a direct inverse of the color palette of the place in which the Velvet Room takes most of its inspiration from. This being the Black Lodge from Twin Peaks. Now the Lodge itself is actually a very strange room in the universe of Twin Peaks, with a lot of strange occurrences and hosts. But most interestingly enough, the speech within the Black Lodge is twisted and deformed. And this is reflected in the world between consciousness and unconsciousness, where only a select few people can actually speak, let alone remember their own name. But alongside this direct reference to the Black Lodge, the color choice actually exists as a callback to mainline SMT and its Cathedral of Shadows, which are both blue-themed and run by a weird old man who fuses demons based on the phases of the moon. Now, the literary origins of the name could be in reference to Edgar Allan Poe's story, The Mask of the Red Death. In said story, there are seven different rooms which represent seven different stages of life. The first being birth with the blue room, and then you have youth as purple, adolescence as green, adult orange, old age as white, imminent death as violet, and then death itself. And the Violet Room being the room in which the Velvet Room takes its name from, as the Violet Room was covered in velvet decor to symbolize being at peace with oncoming death. Also, the loud clock that can be heard throughout the story of Mask of the Red Death is later represented in Persona 3's Velvet Room, and given the overarching theme of death, I think that's pretty understandable. Now, the room itself, in-universe, was created by Philemon, a being who embodies the collective consciousness and is basically God in the Persona universe. Well the one that favors free will and humanity's choices. But he created the room because of a bet with another god named Nihar Lethotep, who I will for convenience sake only refer to as Nepnep -Nep from now on. The bet itself was to see if humanity could overcome its destructive nature and ascend to greatness on its own. And as part of this bet, both Phil and Nepnep -Nep agreed that neither of them could directly interfere with this process. 
and then they both directly interfered with the process. But to try to stay true to this bet, Philly Boy here created the Velvet Room and filled it with his followers in order to indirectly aid humans in their journey. He also gave the room the ability to be shaped by someone's will, or specifically the will of the collective unconscious, and had it stored away in an area between consciousness and unconsciousness. That way, only those with a strong enough will to be able to shape the room would unlock the ability to perceive it. Also, the people who could perceive it had a higher likely chance of actually helping Philemon win his bet. So with that all understood and out of the way, we can finally talk about the original room which appeared in Megami Ivanroku Persona, which design-wise is actually quite normal compared to the ones to come later, but it was the one that was meant to represent its inspiration the most. It is a room surrounded by large velvet curtains and has a nice rugged floor, and inside house the three permanent residents, Igor, Nameless, and Belladonna. The latter of the two are the ones who perform the main theme of the velvet room and appear in every single game, but only appear physically in the first two. And the purpose of the room game Gameplay-wise was really only to help fuse and create more powerful personas or demons to aid you in your journey. So all in all, it's probably the most basic version of the room. Now the room appearing as normal as it does in Persona 1 is realistically explained by the fact that they just didn't establish a theme of the room changing to match someone's will at that point, because, you know, it was the first game and all. Though it could be later explained that the room we see in Persona 1 is the default form of the room, as it wasn't changed by the visitors at the time because they didn't have a single collective idea like other groups of protagonists do, so it's not out of the question to think that the room just didn't change to match any strong desires and this is what the default version of the room looks like. And there's something later on the series that kind of helps back up this theory. Now this theme of a constantly changing velvet room doesn't actually pick up until after Persona 2, but we do see hints of it in Persona 2's velvet room, with the room changing to match the themes of the game, that being all of the residents now work on elevated platforms. And these platforms resemble that of a stage in a lounge bar. And given the themes of rumors and superstition, a lounge bar makes perfect sense for this game's velvet room, as it is a place where those themes thrive at. There's another major theme that this velvet room actually sticks to, but we'll cover that more when we start speaking about the attendance of the Velvet Room. But speaking of such, besides Igor getting a new sick-ass couch, there's also a new person appearing within the Velvet Room. The first Velvet Room attendant, the Demon Painter, or the Demon Artist in Eternal Punishment. Though, like I said, we'll talk more about him in a little bit. The purpose of the Velvet Room gameplay-wise in Persona 2 is actually a lot like the original, but with a different twist on it. You see, it's used to help the team create new Personas via cards that they earn in battle, or mutate Personas that they have leveled past their efficiency. Though the Velvet Room in Persona 2, like I said, is only slightly different than the one in Persona 1, and it isn't until Persona 3 that we get a serious change in the room's design. Welcome to the Velvet Room, my dear young man. So, the room in Persona 3 is an elevator constantly ascending upwards, and inside sits Igor, now at a fortune teller's table instead of being a lazy ass on a couch, and beside him is his new attendant, Elizabeth, or in other timelines, Theodore but he isn't actually canon until PQ or Ultimax. And as you can see, this is the first personal tailored room in the series, with the elevator motif both fitting Minato's climb up Tartarus, but also in Minato's own personal ascension to Messiah status. It is almost quite literally an elevator to heaven. And then you have these small details laid about the room itself, such as the four doors sitting along each side of the elevator, with each of these doors metaphorically representing one of the members of C's that Minato will grow a bond with over the course of the game. Especially when you enter the room for the first time, only two of these eight doors are uncovered, which is because you've only truly met Yukari and Junpei at that point. But also the room houses two different clocks, which both metaphorically represent the seventh room of the Mask of the Red Death's clock, but also represent both the Midnight Hour and the Doomsday Clock which are strongly connected to the themes of death within Persona 3. And then you also have the chair that Minuto sits on, which is designed to represent Orpheus' lyre, showing that he will be using Personas to support him throughout his journey. And now, gameplay-wise, the room itself is actually not too much different than all the other rooms so far, as you only really use it to fuse Personas and check the compendium to pull Personas that you may have lost during Fusion Out. But there's also side quests involving the attendant and helping them understand the human world. And now this aspect of the Velvet Room changing drastically to match the protagonist and themes of the specific game that it's in would become a staple for the Hashino era of Persona, especially with the major changes found in Persona 4. Welcome. 
to the Velvet Room. My, it would seem you have a most unusual destiny lying before you. <laughs> Some introductions. I'm Igor, and I am quite pleased to make your acquaintance. Yes, welcome. And I will be here to accompany you on your travels. You may call me Margaret. Now this Velvet Room is probably the most unique design-wise in the entire series, as it takes the form of a limousine being driven through a foggy landscape, and inside this limousine is, of course, Igor, like always. And next to him is Narakami's only assistant, Margaret, and no one else. Now, the room itself being a car with a set destination moving through a foggy terrain is representative of the investigation team, or specifically, you, and their journey to uncover the truth within the fog of lies created by Izanami, only ever really stopping in its travels when you, or the investigation team, reach a standstill in the case, or when the case itself is solved and the fog is lifted. Alongside this, the room taking the form of a limousine also plays into a secondary theme of Persona 4, that being media and how it's perceived as the Persona 4 team wanted to comment on the clouded fog of useless information that crowded all sorts of media these days, such as celebrities, scandals, cynicism, or all three combined. All these parts of modern day media that fog any sort of truth that any of these sources want to cover. But they also recognized not everyone who could see this fog in the media was in the right, so they showed that even in a metaphorically safe space, someone isn't void of clouding their judgment, as seen through all the alcohol that litters the inside of the limo velvet room, showing that even when someone thinks they're safe from the fog, they can easily be clouded by other things inside of a safe area, which is easily a representation of one of the moral choices that the player makes during the game, where you think you know who the killer is and you try to act on that, but your actions may may be clouded by emotions, which is much like the violent reactionary actions of a drunk. Now gameplay wise, the Velvet Room doesn't actually change all that much from Persona 3, but the one change is, instead of moon phases, Persona 4's Velvet Room is affected by the weather, as it is the only honest force in the entire game, therefore more emphasizing the truth aspect of the story. But also, like in Persona 3, you can take requests from your personal attendant. And an interesting little detail actually about the Velvet Room itself, the limousine's license plate contains the area code in which CJ Young lived, the man who inspired the creation of Philemon. So that was just like a little neat detail. Now, over these past few Velvet Rooms, we've seen rooms created specifically to help a guest's journey. But what if a room itself was twisted and deformed, taken over forcibly by someone who isn't a servant of Philemon, and instead of a room made to help humanity's growth, it was a room designed to imprison outliers who may aid in humanity's growth. No longer a Velvet Room, more of a Velvet Prison of sorts. <laughs> Trickster, welcome to my Velvet Room. So the prison room from Persona 5 is actually a very strange Velvet Room, as it wasn't originally intended to imprison Akira, but had its intentions twisted and modified by Yeltabeth, a demiurge who broke into the room in order to lead humanity to ruin. The room itself became a prison, which gifted people would be held and would be led down a path that Yeltabeth was most pleased by, as he also took the form of Igor, and tore the attendant into two different creations that he could puppet to keep his illusion going. All the while chaining down anyone with the ability to overpower him and tricking them down the path that he so chooses, all while referring to them as the tricksters. 
And with the whole prison aesthetic of Akira's Velvet Room being a front for Yeltabeth's mission, we never really learn what his true Velvet Room form would have been, but we do get a glimpse at what it might have been through his true attendant Lavenza and his final persona, the ultimate judge, Sentinel. Akira's prison cell was never meant for him. He would have been the one who was imprisoning the guilty. Though, speaking of attendants, let's actually start talking about the residents of the Velvet Room starting with the three permanent residents, that being Nameless, the pianist, Belladonna, the singer, and Igor, the host. Nameless and Belladonna, even though not visible in Persona 3 through 5, are in fact still in the Velvet Room, and their song is what allows Igor to connect to the demon world and summon forth Personas or demons, because you see, funny enough, originally, Igor used to use a phone to call up demons based on the phone numbers he found on the back of the tarot cards which represented them, though over time, Igor managed to contact them through different means, such as fortune telling. And if you haven't picked up on the themes of their names yet, I'll tell you, they're all in reference to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or other classic horror movie icons, starting of course with Igor, the most obvious, as he is the loyal servant of anyone who enters the Velvet Room, and Philemon, much like his named counterpart is the loyal servant of Victor Frankenstein and Count Dracula in the classic Universal Monster Movie franchise, as he takes his design specifically from the Martin Fieldman Igor with a long nose, buggy eyed, and hunchback demeanor, and also the fact that there is no Igor in the original Frankenstein novel. And Belladonna follows suit with Igor being named after Bella Lugosi, not only the most recognizable Count Dracula, but also one of the many actors who played an embodiment of Igor at some point, albeit a very different Igor than the Igor that Igor is based off of, but an Igor nonetheless. Her purpose in the Velvet Room is to calm the souls of all who enter, be it guest or demon, and if it is a demon, this allows Nameless and Igor to convert them into personas. And speaking of Nameless, he is the blindfolded pianist who gets his name from the Nameless Blind Man who meets and befriends the monster from Frankenstein, as he does so through his sweet sounds of music which calm a scared and injured beast, and then he teaches them to speak and read, helping shape a monster into something much more. Nameless does much of the same by playing his piano in sync with Belladonna singing to calm any monster who enters, but also using the piano to help Igor in the conversion process of the Demon 2 persona. And as it stands, he's probably the most important member of the Velvet Room, given that he is the first thing you here as you enter the room itself. But over time, the Velvet Room has more than just its permanent inhabitants and introduces a few attendants as the years go by. The first attendant of the Velvet Room is the demon painter slash artist, the only Velvet Room character who doesn't have a Frankensteiner movie monster reference in him. Instead, he is an in-house reference to series artist Kaneko who is the artist behind all of the demon designs in SMT and Persona right up until about Persona 4. He also isn't a creation of Igor or Philemon, he is just a human who originally lived in Samaru City, but hasn't lived there or in the human world for several decades at this point, meaning he's gone past the point of being human a while ago. Much like Nameless, he claims to be about 200 years old. The Demon Painter was introduced to the Velvet Room due to the themes of memories and their importance in Persona 2, as through his mastery of art, he helps create tarot cards for the player, which are physical embodiments of memories for both humans and demons. He does this by painting over blank cards or free spaces in someone's memory and creating a brand new set of memories for them to use, and with those new memories come new personas. He also is only limited by his inability to mimic the full arcana and the four minor suits, which are cup, wand, coin, and sword. Besides that, he can mimic just about every single arcana, and he's a very useful asset for the players. And from here we reach the second set of attendants, from Persona 3, with Elizabeth and Theodore, who design-wise are based off of bellhops given the elevator theme of the Velvet Room, and they both get their names from two different characters in Frankenstein. I'm going to start with Elizabeth. Elizabeth gets her name from Elizabeth Lavenza, the sister-in-law of Dr. Victor Frankenstein, and throughout the story would encourage Victor to act as positively as he can as a force for humanity to cleanse himself of the guilt for creating the monster. This is reflected in the multitude of letters and requests that Elizabeth gives you during the game, encouraging Minato to climb to Tartarus and cleanse himself of sin. Now, originally, she wasn't really part of a big planned happy family that we see later on in the Velvet Room, but she did gain a sister and a brother. And speaking of her brother, let's talk about Theodore. Theodore gets his name from Dr. Theodore Bowman, from the Ghost of Frankenstein. Originally the teacher of Ludwig Frankenstein, but now the assistant, Bomer believes himself to be more knowledgeable than his former student, which leads him to try to overthrow his position and take control of the lab, resulting in his inevitable death. This is partly reflected 
dominated by Theodore's overconfidence in his understanding of the human world, while ending up being more clueless than any of the other attendants. Theodore also is the lowest in the pecking order in just about every way, being only canon in spin-off games like Persona Q and Persona 4 Arena Ultimax in Space on Ice the Movie the Game, Theodore doesn't really seem to have a purpose other than comic relief, him even explaining that his two sisters bully him quite frequently, with both Elizabeth and Margaret feeding him dog food without actually ever telling him until after he ate it. But speaking of Margaret, she's actually the only assistant who appears in Persona 4, taking up the role after her sister vanishes at the end of Persona 3. She dresses like a secretary or a manager, and has a personality very similar to such, and given the themes of Persona 4 and the Velvet Room, she is likely Yu's manager in the sense. She also, like her sister, carries around Le Grimoire, a massive book which contains the player's compendium of all the demons that they've met. She also seems to be the most expressive of all the Velvet Room attendants, actually seeming to have a grasp on the outside world much better than Elizabeth and Theodore do, but she also is the least serious of the three given her tendency to mock Igor and having the Persona 4 crew literally strike Jojo poses in Persona Q. This mix of seriousness and silliness makes her come off as the most adult of all of the Velvet Room attendants. Margaret gets her name from Margaret Walter Seville, a bit of a non-character from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the recipient of the letters written by the narrator about the events of the story. But it's actually later been understood that Margaret Seville is a stand-in name for Mary Shelley, making the character more important than it actually was, and sort of making the first real self-insert character in any major cultural work of fiction. Margaret is a reflection of this by being the most precognitive attendant in the entire game series, making her come off as an author of Persona 4 story in a way. She manages to have a solid grasp on the outside world without ever actually visiting it, and I mean, she is the one who gave Narukami the plot item he needed so he could unlock his true persona. She knew everything was going to happen before it ever actually did, and she even manages to show up in other stories, specifically in Persona 3 Portable, where she manages to show up and mess with that timeline too. And this is even more apparent in Persona 4 The Animation, when Margaret is the one who has to come and knock the sense into Narukami, making sure that he doesn't just bend over and accept a never-ending, never-progressing life of lies just so he can stay safe. She needed to make sure her story ended on a positive note. Though with Margaret, this closes out the original Velvet Room family as over time they would travel outside the room for a multitude of different reasons, specifically with Elizabeth hoping to help find a way to help Minato and free his soul from the Lock of Nyx. Though speaking of relatives, and Elizabeth specifically, we reach the final set of attendants, this being Carolina and Justine, and their true form, Lavenza. Now the twins are actually a single being ripped into two, along with their design being twisted and distorted by Yeltabeth, and his new distorted view of the Velvet Room. They were forced to wear prison uniforms and berate their new inmate, aka the guest of the Velvet Room. Also, each of them missing a different eye shows their incompleteness, but most importantly is the detail about their hat, as together they contain the letters for Oxymoron, which given how each of their personalities are a polar opposite of each other because they're one being ripped into two, they end up canceling each other out, but also in the sense that their existence is an Oxymoron, as they are a dominating servant. And now each of them get their name, like all the other intendants, from a Frankenstein character. Justine from a little girl who moved in with Frankenstein at the age of 12 and was unjustly executed for a murder that the monster committed. And Carolina gets her name from Victor's mother, an eccentric woman whose dying wish was for her son to marry a woman. That woman being Elizabeth Lavenza. Which is why when the twins fuse together back into Lavenza, it's via execution, combining both of their names together to create the Lavenza character. Which is also why if you defeat the twins prior to them becoming Lavenza, she will actually confess her feelings to Akira. Speaking of Lavenza, we actually only see a very little bit of her during the entirety of the run of the game, as she only appears for like, I believe only a day's worth of time. All we know about her at that point is that she was the newest attendant of the Velvet Room, and instead of a prison guard outfit, she was given a maid-like design, and she carries a Le Grimoire compendium and not a clipboard compendium. Though we can assume that she is at least considerably powerful, because even when broken apart into two separate beings, she was still able to take butterfly form and guide us like her master's master. Also, much like Elizabeth in Persona 3, Lavenza help encourages Akira and the Phantom Thieves to continue on in their journey, even when things seem completely hopeless. 
And now, before I wrap up, I should also mention some other things. Marie has nothing to do with the Velvet Room. She is a rogue deity who accidentally stumbled into the room. She has no connection to it in any way, and she's also shit. And Morgana isn't technically an attendant. While sort of being one, he was created last second as an attempt for Igor to make someone who could guide Akira to overcoming Yeltabeth's influence. So he's sort of a semi-attendant. But lastly, I want to talk about that thing I brought up when I was speaking about Persona 1's Velvet Room, and how the Persona Q Velvet Room kind of hints at the fact that Persona 1's Velvet Room is the default version of the Velvet Room. Because as we see, in Persona Q, the Velvet Room gets locked into a time rift. And in this time rift, the room maintains a more Persona 1 and 2-esque design, with the only thing from Persona 3 or 4 in it is Igor's fortune telling table that Margaret uses, which gives off the idea that the Persona 1 version of the room is likely the base form of the Velvet Room. And also, how could I forget to mention the most important version of the Velvet Room, the one that appears in Persona 4 Dancing All Night. Now you see, it takes the form of a dance club, not because of the atmosphere and dancing happy mood that Persona 4 Dancing All Night has, but it's a metaphorical club which Atlas was using to repeatedly beat the dead horse of an IP that was Persona 4 at the time. It was actually an in-universe cry for help to the players. And with that, that completes our journey throughout the history and understanding of the Velvet Room and all of its attendants. And I know I didn't cover absolutely everything, this video is long enough as it is. I know there's individual journeys that characters like Elizabeth take outside of the Velvet Room that could play more into their character, but I'm gonna save that for a video all by itself. I mean, I mean Elizabeth is a pretty strong contender for one of the best characters in Persona. And I hope you enjoyed this time together, but before you go, if you like this video and like to fund more videos like it in the future, I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash guy. This video was a huge undertaking, and it's probably the longest one I've done in a long while. So, it, it would really help if you'd go there, maybe like $3. I, I do a lot smaller projects than this usually, but this was like a big project that I've been wanting to do. And if you'd ever want to return to a Velvet Room of your own, well first you must purchase a copy of Shimonetta, A Boring World with a Concept of Dirty Jokes Doesn't Exist at funimation.com slash show slash Shimonetta, A Boring World with a Concept of Dirty Jokes Doesn't Exist this, buy yourself a copy of Shimonetta and it, inside each copy comes with a key to your own personal velvet room.